Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. So it's been a long, long time since I last uploaded a video. It's been a couple of weeks um, and I hope you, you're you all doing well and that your applications are going well. Um, and so now as we kind of transition in that period where people are writing their personal statements, sending off their applications, um, I hope all of you managed to get your applications in on time. Please try to not leave it too late. Um, and then we can move on into kind of like interview practice and prep. And so that's the kind of idea over these next couple of months. I thought I would release some videos on that um, as well as just perhaps some more general videos about what you should be trying to do um, during year 12 and year 13. Um, that might be something that I think I will do a video on as well. Um, if you guys would like to see that, please do let me know down below. So I thought that what I would do is I would cover different areas in different videos. So today I'm going to be talking about Huntington's disease. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about it is because often in many medical school interviews, they'll have a station that's called like NHS Hot Topics or just Hot Topics, which is basically... Um, they're trying to test you on your current knowledge, okay? Which is very important because often people say, oh yes, I read this paper or I read these journals, but they want to actually make sure that you kind of know what you're talking about and that you're staying up to date on the most kind of common things. And I think this is especially something that um, popped up in the news quite recently last week or so or the week before, and it was quite a big, um, uh, qu quite a big, it's, it's been quite a big discovery essentially, okay? So I thought that I would go over that really, really quickly. And as you can see, I've broken it down into three kind of key sections. Just before we start, please do let me know what other areas you'd like to cover, whether it be specific questions. Um, and um, yeah, I'll do my best to try and get through some for you guys, okay? So let's get straight into things then. So let's have a think about um, the overview of this. So Huntington's disease. So the idea of this video is I'm trying to make something that's like a too long, didn't read type of video. So this is basically, I'm trying to give you guys all the relevant information that you need to know about this disease so that if you were to ask it in like a station, you'd be able to talk about it somewhat. So let's think about the first aspect, which is etiology, which um, is just a fancy word that basically talks about the causes of the disease and what it actually is. So Huntington's is uh, a rare inherited brain uh, disorder, um, and it, it mainly affects movement, thinking, emotions, that kind of thing, and particularly movement. OK, so it's not necessarily one of our biggest um, kind of diseases as such. Right. It's not something like cancer or um, hypertension, something like that. However, it does affect um, a lot of people and um, affects thousands of families worldwide. And it causes progressive decline. OK, and there is currently no cure, which is what's important. There is there is. Well, there was currently no cure. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So what it actually is, is of course, in your brain, um, you have neurons, okay? Um, and those neurons um, are very, very important. Um, and especially in a particular area of the brain called the basal ganglia, okay? In the basal ganglia, um, the neurons play a vital, vital role in movement. So this, in the basal ganglia, there are two kind of key areas. There's the chordate and the putamen. There are some other areas as well, but the chordate and the putamen are really important for initiating kind of movement. Um, and these areas are the ones that are affected in Huntington. So if you can't initiate movement, you're going to have some kind of problems, okay? And what basically causes, um, what, what causes, the, uh, causes the issue is that um, you have something called uh, CAG repeats. So these are just um, the bases. So C, A and G, your DNA bases, which hopefully you guys will remember. Um, and in chromosome four, um, there's a faulty gene um, which has a faultiness that's defined by how long the repeat is. So if the repeat is um, between um, 10 and 26, that's thought to be normal. So if there's 10 to 26 CAG repeats. So basically, it basically means that imagine I've got a long sequence of DNA right now. Um, and imagine I'm looking at the DNA, I'm zooming in on the DNA on like chromosome four, for example. Um, this is what it will look like. So most people um, will have a normal length of CAG repeats. So 10 to 26 is normal. Anything less than that is also fine. An intermediate level is 27 to 35. Some people might have a little bit higher. Both of these will be unaffected. Okay, so if, you're, if you have CAG repeats between 10 to 35, you'll be fine. Then if we go into a little bit higher, so 36 to 39 repeats in a row, um, you will be affected, but you'll have what's called reduced penetrance. So you won't feel the effects as much, or the onset will be a little bit later and the progression won't be as strong. And then full penetrance is if you get 40 or over. So full penetrance is if you get 40 um, or above. Okay. And 
these people will be affected. So this is, that's the main thing. So it's caused by this CAG repeat. And essentially this gene, what it, what it codes for is it codes for the hunting tin protein. Okay, um, HTT is what it's referred to. And if you have a mutant protein, i.e. if you have too many repeats or whatever, then we refer to it as MHTT, so a mutant, okay, a mutant Huntington protein. Um, and so this is, uh, this is important. This is the basis of the disease. Um, and the other important thing about it is that it's autosomal dominant, which basically means, and I think this is probably one of the reasons why it's been such a, um, it's been so um, devastating for people, which basically means that if one of your parents has Huntington's, you have pretty much a 50% chance of getting Huntington's. Okay. okay, so thinking about kind of like genes and um, kind of like genetic diagrams, if, if you remember these kind of diagrams that we had, if you have a think about those. Um, if you have a parent, so normally um, you have one that's uh, a Huntington gene that's, that's faulty and then one that's fine. That's for most people anyways. Technically, you could have two faulty genes. That is true. It's, it's very unlikely. I think the majority of people that do have the disease have one working and one faulty gene. Um, but because it's autosomal dominant, um, so you this is like a genetic cross, you can see that in 50% of the cases, there is uh, the child will have Huntington's. So basically, if one of your parents have Huntington's, there's a 50% chance that you're going to get. And that's a very, very scary thing to think about. Right, especially considering how debilitating it can be, you know, it can um, lead to short, sh shortened lives, and also it's a progressive disease, which means it gets worse and worse um, the further you that you go along. Okay, um, and your kind of outcome and your symptoms become worse as you go along further. So um, the point to make here is, I think that even though it might not be a, necessarily a disease that you guys may have heard of at all, or that it, or even like a a big disease, right? You know, we're not curing a specific type of cancer, or even something like that here. The point is it can have a really, really big effect on families um, uh, who already have known members um, with Huntington's and especially their children. It can be very, very scary. And so that's why this new research, which we'll come on to in just a second, has provided a lot of hope for people. Um, and it's also kind of ease of mind. So actually, without even doing any healing, it's kind of given these guys some kind of um, strength and the knowledge that not all hope is lost, basically, whereas previously they really couldn't do anything about it, unfortunately. OK, so that's the kind of main idea. So Huntington. So I guess just expanding a little bit on the protein. So the Huntington protein in itself um, is mainly found in the brain, like I said, in, in those particular areas it, within neurons. Um, it is found in other areas such as the liver um, and other parts of the body, but it's mainly within the brain um, and it interacts with loads of other different proteins. You don't need to know it to this tiny extent. I don't really think it matters too much. Um, but if it when it becomes mutant, um, so by that, because it has a different... Um, you know, DNA code, perhaps the protein, instead of interacting with proteins it's meant to, it might interact with different ones. Um, you know, it's just a thought. I'm sure you guys can go on and read more about it if you want to go to PubMed, search in Huntington, etc., etc. Um, but the main point is that it's no longer working how it should be. It's a mutant protein, um, which is encoded um, by these CAG repeats. OK, and as we've clarified, it's it's a problem um, because it affects um, the brain, it affects movement and there's no current treatment or cure. OK, so what did the new research show? So what the new research showed is that there was a um, new therapy that was used. OK, so gene therapy. So you guys may not be aware of this. Gene therapy has been around for a while. So all gene therapy is, is gene therapy is the idea of trying to treat or prevent diseases by modifying someone's genetic material. That's why the word comes in, so gene therapy. Most of the medications we take are kind of exogenous drugs that we put into our body, right? It's a medication and the medication acts on the target or something. So this is kind of the opposite way around. So if you think about this, so you've got your cell here, let's say you've got a receptor, and let's say you've got a drug. So let's say you've got beta blockers. So um, beta blockers are used to slow people's heart rates. Um, so let's say you've got your beta blocker, it comes in here and it stops, um, acts on this receptor and doubts somehow, right, I won't go into, into detail, it results in a reduced heart rate, okay? You can see this is kind of acting from the outside to the inside. The idea of gene therapy is it's kind of acting the other way around. You act, you actually act from the inside out. So the idea is that you deliver genetic material. So you, you deliver genetic material using a virus as a vector. Because viruses are very, very clever. 
what they can do is uh, viruses hijack our cells, right? So from biology, you should know that bacteria just replicate themselves. They have their own machinery, but viruses can't do that. They need to actually physically enter our cells. So viruses are very clever. They enter cells and they use the host's machinery to, to um, make the things that they need, the viral proteins and capsids, et cetera, et cetera. So what you can actually do is um, you can get an inactive virus and you can feed the right gene that you want in. So here it might be, okay, we want to um, replace this mutant Huntington gene with a better version. Um, so a, an unaffected version with, let's say, less CAG repeats or whatever it might be. Um, and so that therapeutic DNA is going to be carried in alongside this viral DNA, like it's infused. But obviously, the, vi the viral DNA has been inactivated. So researchers are very, very clever. They've managed to find a way to combine the two. So they, um, so the, the virus just acts to get into the cells, um, whereas the actual therapeutic DNA is the one that's being made by the, um, the brain neurons. Okay, And so therefore, you create... So you no longer have the mutant protein, you have the working protein. So we switch from having MHTT to just regular HTT. Okay, so that's that's an idea behind it as such. Okay, so these findings. Uh, so this is this was the big research, and that was really really important. Um, and so what they found is so they did this and they tested it, and the early findings um suggested that gene therapy um not only preserved brain cell health. Um, because you no longer get as much of the mutant protein, but you get the healthy protein be made. Um, but also may allow people to retain their independence for longer. So if you guys saw the article on BBC News, um, which is where I first saw it, um, it said that this approach actually slowed the clinical progression of Huntington's by up to 75% over three years, okay, which is massive, okay, so 75% um, slowing over three years. And I know that might not seem like a lot, um, but if you think about someone who's at 100 percent in terms of and so this was based on um, three things, I believe it was based on like movement, thinking and kind of daily functions. OK, so movement, thinking and daily functions. So if you think about where you're at right now, um, movement wise, um, you guys are probably able to do pretty much anything you want right? Um, and uh, you have brain capacity is absolutely fine. Your daily functions are, will probably be completely fine. So now imagine you, let's say, let's go quite extreme. Imagine you lose half of your body's movements. So let's say your left arm and your left leg just stop working. Okay, that would be if you were down to 50%. Okay. But since so you lose 50% there, but since this slows it by up to 75%, so at best case scenario, instead of going down to 50%, now you go down to like 87.5. So you only lose 12.5% instead of losing 50%. Okay, because you, instead of losing 50%, you now lose 25% or 50% because you've saved 75%. Because remember what you said, it slowed it up to 75%. Okay, and obviously it's not true for every single patient, but it is really, really promising because 87.5% might be instead of you losing complete um, function in your, in your left leg or whatever it was, it might be that you can't walk more than one mile. But you can still, but that will still allow you to do household things. And this might not seem like a lot um, because I think that often when people think about medicine and about treatments for medicine, it's always from a curative standpoint. You always think, okay, we've got to cure someone until they're back and 100% ill. If you think about someone who's elderly and um, is bed bound, right, they'll be more than happy if they manage to walk, you know, 50, 100 steps a day so that they can go to the toilet, so they can go to the kitchen, little things like that. Yes, they probably won't be able to run a 5k or even a 1k or perhaps even run at all, but it doesn't matter because that's not kind of what they're aiming to do, right? Um, and at the end of the day, it's just about improving every single individual person's quality of life, um, which will be something that you'll hear me talk about a lot uh, in future videos. So even though it might not seem like, you know, oh, surely that, you know, it's still, it's still difficult because there's no cure for them. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It will still be difficult, but it means that the, the time they have available will be longer. And importantly, they, the quality of life that they have um, will also um, be much better when it comes to... So I was mainly talking about movement, but you can apply this to thinking and also daily functions as well. Because I think often we take for granted um, 
some of the uh, things that we're able to do. There's an old quote that says, you know, you have 100 problems until you have a health problem. Um, and I think it's really, really true. People don't often realise how blessed they are or how lucky they are to be able to do the things they can do. And I think that this is a specifically, you know, um, a very, very good case of that. So that's basically the summary of what this new research has shown. Um, and I think that obviously um, for uh, people who... Um, uh, have family members that are afflicted. So I think in the BBC News article, they, there was an individual who said that their father had had it um, and that he had received a positive diagnosis. So obviously you can get your... Um, you can get this level, the levels of CAG, um, of the CAG repeats tested. And so you can find out if you're eventually going to unfortunately end up with Huntington's or not. And he said that this, I, th I think, I believe, he said that this was kind of, it, it, it was big news, right? And he was trying, it, it, it was a positive for him. So whilst even though he had had a diagnosis of Huntington's, it was um, a glimmer of hope, basically, which is important. Um, and of course, there are downsides to this, you know, gene therapies are very, very expensive because they are very, very top of the line research. Um, and um, yes, there might not be that many, um, it might not even be available on the NHS or whatever it might be. However, um, you know, it is, it is very, very important because it shows that the field is heading in the right direction. You know, 10, 15, even 20 years ago, these would have been thought of as uncurable diseases, but um, it just shows what you can do uh, with the advances in medical science. Okay, so um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was conclusions. So when it comes to Huntington's disease, I think often, I think even actually the BBC article itself um, may have actually used the words treated. So um, I think the title of the article was Huntington's disease successfully uh, treated for the first time. And when I read this, I thought that there had actually been a cure. Um, I thought that they'd found some way to just reverse the thing. Um, which unfortunately is not true, um, right? You know, they slowed the progression. And so I, I think perhaps, and this is a bit more of a, a general concept, is when you're trying to explain concepts like this, or if you get asked a question on this, or you get asked your thoughts, it's always good if you can try and be a little bit more niche about things, right? Give your perspective on something. Think about something interesting that you can talk about. So here, for example, about Huntington's, you can say about, whilst this is all good, you know, it's still not a treatment yet. And yeah, it might be true. We might never be able to find a treatment. It might not be possible. But, you know... If you told someone 100 years ago that you, two people from America and Australia could communicate with each other without any... Okay, maybe not 100 years ago, but let's say 1,000 years ago or even 500 years ago, could communicate without, to each other with a millisecond delay. Um, I'm talking about the mobile phone here. They would have said, you know, that's not possible. Like, it's magic. Like, it can't happen. And same thing with all the advances that we've made, whether it be little things like vaccines... Um, to other things like, you know, crazy things like open heart surgery or even fetal surgery, right? These are all very, very um, futuristic ideas at the time. And so I think the same thing here. So you could talk about, yes, while we don't have a cure as such, um, you know, whilst this is a good um, potential option, um, this isn't really necessarily a cure, um, and also you could use the word treatment. So I guess you are treating the illness to some extent. So you could argue treatment is the right word. But in my, my eyes anyway, I think um, treatment, I associate more with it being curative. Um, but unfortunately, medicine isn't always about being curative. Sometimes it's about prioritizing the patient as much as we can and putting them in the best possible position, um, as such as things like palliative care. Um, but just something that I thought I would um, put put down below um, just to, you know, make, make you guys think about something. And I thought perhaps a little bit of homework, perhaps you guys can comment down below um, something about, you know, Huntington's and about um, any take home messages, anything interesting that you've read. Um, and it could be helpful that way to help each other as well. Um, you guys could read each other's comments, you know, have a debate, talk about something um, and see what you truly believe. And any of these points I've mentioned here, you know, I, I know I've talked a little bit about it, but you can always go on and do more research. You don't necessarily have to, um, but I thought that that was um, a, a fairly concise-ish concise summary um, about a really important point. Okay? Awesome. So um, thank you so so much if you've got, gotten this far into the video. Um, and I will do my best um, to upload some videos over the next coming week, weeks or so. Uh, just please let me know down below what you'd like to see. Um, and I will catch you guys in the next video. Take care and see you in a bit.